have uh, Mr. Mills' Thank you, uh, oral testimony. My name is Alan Mills from the Uptown People's Law Center. I'm the legal director there. I've been uh, litigating cases on behalf of prisoners in the Illinois Department of Corrections since I started, well, actually before I was licensed to practice law as a law student, um, in 1980. Um, I think the overarching points you need to understand about TAMS is, first of all, like any prison, they work better when the rule of law is in force. Prisons, aside from better than any place else in society, ought to be run according to clear standards. Because after all, people are in prison because they didn't follow some rules on the outside. And the best way to get them re rehabilitated is to make sure that there are clear laws, clear benefits of following those laws, and clear punishments if you don't follow them. The problem at TAMS is those laws are lacking. The second point is, as Mr. Cup Dr. Cupper stated, we don't take the position that most people who work at TAMS are evil, nor are most prisoners there evil. It's a situation that's been created, and that situation affects the behavior of everybody there. And I wasn't going to start with medical, but since he went before me, I will. Um, the, um, he, he's right. Nurses go around the entire prison every day. They are packed with nurses at TAMS, and that's because they know perfectly well that TAMS drives people crazy. So they have, most of those nurses are, have some training anyway in mental health. That's most of their responsibilities, is to try to see whether or not prisoners are in fact going crazy. Unfortunately, their rounds mean that they stand on a unit and say, does anybody here have a problem? There's no confidentiality. If there is a problem, then that means they go to their cell door, but they still have to yell through the cell door, as Dr. Cuppers uh, stated, and find out if that person has serious mental illness issues yelling through a screen door, through a solid steel door with little tiny holes in it. No one on the outside community would think that's the right way to uh, deliver medical services. The doctor has only been there three months, uh, but he's not quite right. He doesn't have authority to fix everything because all medical care in Illinois, including at TAMS, is contracted out to a private agency, to a private for-profit company. And that for-profit company operates according to a written contract with the state of Illinois. So there are only certain things that the state can demand of that as long as the contract is in force. It's only when the contract comes up for renewal that they can make them change things. The first response of all of those nurses that go around when a prisoner makes a complaint is, he's malingering. He just wants out of his cell. He just wants some attention. Unfortunately, Chronic problems are not tracked. The theory is exactly what he described, but the reality is not. Hector Rivera was in Stateville. He, was, he went through a preliminary uh, prostate cancer screening at Stateville. They found a problem. They started off with antibiotics, which is the first legitimate step you should do, and said follow up in 90 days, get another test to see whether or not your PST levels have gone down. Before that 90 days was up, he was transferred to TAMS. For the next two years at TAMS, he told every nurse who came to his cell, I was tested for prostate cancer, it was positive, I was supposed to have a follow-up test, give it to me. They didn't. He ended up in so much pain that when I went down there to see him, he was crawling on the floor because he couldn't stand up. They finally then did transfer him to an outside hospital. The doctor said, oh, you now have cancer which has metastasized throughout your whole body. They transferred him immediately to Pontiac, took him to an outside doctor for chemotherapy, and less than a month later he was dead. So, yes, their records follow you, but that doesn't mean somebody actually reads them. It doesn't mean that they follow up on the test that the doctor beforehand had said so. It doesn't mean that the doctor in the first instance had documented everything in the file like he ought to. The 1993 report is where you should start your study. This was the final report issued by the Governor's Task Force on Crimes and Punishment. They said on page 87 of that report. The supermax prison should not be a permanent assignment. Quote, on the contrary, there should be a steady stream of inmates coming out so that inmates in the maximum security facilities know that there is room to accommodate them if they engage in violent and disruptive behavior. They also said, on page 88, the supermax prison should house only those inmates who have in their current incarceration inflicted or caused others to inflict physical harm against staff or inmates. They also said that there should be clear standards for how you get in and out of TAMS, and they said that prisoners should be reviewed every 30 days to see if they've met those standards. 
None of that is being done. When TAMS opened, the Department of Corrections has admitted they had no standards at all. The regulations weren't in place. They simply went around and asked wardens, is there anybody you'd like to send to TAMS? And they came up with a long list, and that list included, absolutely, people who were, who were in the most responsible positions in some of the maximum security prisons. Joe Sorrentino was in the officer's kitchen, working with knives, preparing the officer's food every day at Menard. He was sent to TAMS without any disciplinary report. He just Somebody came to a cell at 3 a.m. one morning, put him on a bus, took him to TAMS. Since he's been at TAMS, I don't think he's had a single disciplinary report, certainly not many. He's still there 10 years later. They do do 90-day reviews at TAMS. Those are purely paper reviews. The prisoner never sees anybody. No one has ever been released from TAMS during one of those 90-day reviews after the first month that people started coming there. They clearly made some errors in the first, maybe it was two months, and a bunch of guys came in and right back out again. Since then, no one has ever been released on one of those 90-day reviews. The step-down program is a good thing. It's good that they finally are letting people out of TAMS. However, it's really necessary because of a complete failure of the actual regulations. What happened here is that no one was getting out of TAMS, having gone through the three levels that exist on paper, they're in the written regulations, you can see what they are. If you behave for three months, you get a higher level of, uh, benef of uh, privileges. You get to go to the yard three times a week instead of only once a week. You get three showers a week instead of only once a week. You get four visits instead of only two visits. Once you work your way through those three, then you're supposed to be eligible to get out. And you're supposed to go a face-to-face -face hearing once a year in front of a, a transfer review committee to see if you're ready to go out. Nobody was getting out through that process. No one. So TAMS did, made up a new program, the renunciation policy. Said that the transfer review committee has no authority to transfer anybody out, no matter how good your behavior has been, unless you have satisfied some unwritten criteria that you have renounced your association with a gang, which you may not even know why they think you're in a gang in the first place, and that the, they admit that you think you're honest in your renunciation. There are no standards for that. It is not contained in the regulations. It never went through the regulatory public review process. It never became for this committee or any other committee of the legislature to be reviewed as to whether or not the people of the state of Illinois thought that was a good program to have. This is something that was made up entirely by the Department of Corrections internally. There are no standards that are applied. So a prisoner doesn't know exactly what they're looking for. It doesn't know what you have to do to do that. There are many prisoners there who say, Yes, I was clearly part of a gang many years ago before I went to TAMS. I, in fact, was violated out. I talked to internal affairs that I was in violated out. I went to an outside hospital because I had broken bones because I was violated out of the gang. And here I am at TAMS, and you're now telling me in order to get out of TAMS, I have to renounce my, my affiliation with something that I haven't been part of for the last 15 years. And you know that perfectly well. And in order to do that, I'm supposed to give you inside information about a gang which I've had nothing to do with for the last 15 years. So in order, they weren't letting anybody out because of that. And the warden and everybody else knew that was not a good idea, that people shouldn't just be at TAMS forever. So they recreated this step-up program or step-down program. And what that is is the warden, at his sole and absolute discretion, with no written standards, no standards at all that anybody's shown to us, has the right to pluck somebody out and say, even though you, don't, even though you haven't finished all whatever procedures there are out there, I think you're ready to go. And then some people get out. So it's good that they're letting some people out. It's bad that there is no objective criteria that anybody knows about to govern that. And Mr. Cannon was absolutely right. When a new warden comes in, since it's a completely subjective decision, he can say, well, whatever I was doing, whatever the old guy was doing is irrelevant. I have my own subjective criteria, and I'm not going to tell you what they are, but you're not going, or you are going. There's no understanding as to why that happens.